Hello, Living Word family. We are glad that you've joined us on YouTube. We want you to be a part of this message that touches your life every day. So on behalf of Pastor Pierre, my wife and I, we are glad that you engage. We want you to subscribe because there's so many messages on here that you could listen to on your leisure. We are glad that we're able to serve you. But we also want you to go to our website. When you go to our website, you will find a lot more information, even the sermon outlines. And also, you can provide an opportunity for you to see a list of our materials, books that you can look at that meets your need, and you could share with other family members or friends. We could also give. As you give to Living Word, you know us. When you go to our website and you do that, we use those funds to serve the agenda of God for the glory of God, and that allows us to serve you effectively. So we're glad you're here with us. Subscribe, be a part of this, and I pray you join us again and keep involved as God so leads you so that we grow through these times and are coming out of it better than we went in. Thanks for allowing us to serve you. For those of you who may not understand, a lot of uh, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the scriptures, does God ever talk about the style of music. He only talked about the lyrics. So anything you go to the time of Jesus Christ when he was uh, in the temples listening to music, a different style of music. But he did not demand that we have the same style. Just, to, just make sure the lyrics are biblically based. So every culture can use whatever style they like. But the lyrics... You right there in Colossians chapter 3, it's all over the Bible. But Colossians chapter 3 is a good passage to look at. So that's why we, are young, we allow our young people to be engaged in worship in the way that they can enjoy worship. I've been, I'm excited that we've been able this year month. Um, this is our culmination of all this time. I'm excited this, in this month to see our young people excited. That comes because of parents and teachers in the back. And this is my chance to get to minister to them since I never get to go back there. There's a way of also for me to minister to them. So we've dealt with several things. We've dealt with, as I said during the offering time, we've dealt with decisions and how they could lead to regrets. We've dealt with that. We've dealt with friends. And what is a true friend? Because pastoring here, I've seen young people grow up and pick wrong friends, whether it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, or just a friend. And those decisions that they made impacted their lives negatively. So that's why we chose friends. We also, you know, we're also going to, today we want to look at, we tend to take words lightly. Words. They're all over the place. Why would Jesus Christ say, I am the word? Satan has taken words and he has used them because he's not a creative, he's not a creator, so he also has to work with the creation. Jesus Christ says, I am the word. He started off everything in the Bible with words. Satan has taken words and he's done a lot of things with it. And it has hurt our young people because we tend to take words lightly. So let's take a look at that in Proverbs chapter, beginning in Proverbs chapter 15. I don't want you to leave Proverbs today. When you find chapter 15, we're going to do a dance through the scriptures today on words. We could do this, we could do a whole series on words that we could all learn from. Please remember what the Bible says about words. If a person could control their tongue, they could control the entire body. <laughs> if a person could control the tongue, which we all struggle to control, all of us, we can practice true religion, James chapter 1, verse 26. How many of us have used words we regret? Don't drop your head. This is where you say amen. I, I've used words. Even sometimes when I listen to my message, after I preach it, I go, ah, oh, I could have said that better. So, <laughs> so you're always trying to manage words. In Proverbs chapter 15, look at verse 4. It starts off in verse, 5, verse 1. You could use that. He talks about it all the way through. Uh, but, but the focus we're going to do is verse 4 to keep this focus on words. Well, verse 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath. A harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue 
of a, the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. You go to verse 4, he brings it back up. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. You can look at chapter 18, then we go to Matthew 18. I'm going to these passages of Scripture so you could mark your Bible, all right? Uh, a lot of the Pentecostal movement have misinterpreted the scripture, so they're trying to turn things by their words. I speak this into being because the power is in the tongue. That's not what he's saying. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, he says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Parents, please remember this verse. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, I keep telling your kid they're a fool. They will, you will eat it. It will come back to you. I want you to see the power of words. We could do a whole series on this. Look at Matthew chapter 12. We could all grow from, and I mean that. I'm not trying to be uh, nice. We could all grow from this. I've been married a long time. And there's some words I wish I didn't say. Words. Look at verse 36, he says, of chapter 12. And I want you to... St- you could tear up the bulletin, just don't tear the pastor's corner. I'm all right. Isn't that selfish? That's selfish, isn't it? <laughs> no, I honestly just want you to read it. <laughs> Verse 20, 36, he says, And I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. And by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Look at Ephesians. That's what I'm saying. God started everything off with words. Satan took the words and used it for his own purposes. So we, social media and everything else got a lot of words. And we just jump into it. We don't realize that it's a tool that God has provided to either bless us or curse us. In Ephesians chapter 4 this is, a, this is the last passage we're going to turn to. Verse 29, he says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for the edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed with the day of redemption. Words can stunt the growth of the Holy Spirit in your life. Words. Dear God, we thank you so much for not taking for granted the things that you know as our dad, our daddy, as your son would say on the cross, for granted the things that you know would hurt us so that you can guide us through this life to be all you want us to be as our dad. So that when we, you finally bring us home, we don't have the simple things that you've blessed us to have be misused and therefore have to hold us accountable for them. It's a guide, Lord, especially our young people today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Words are powerful. They're very powerful. As we see, you keep telling a child they're no good. You have never going to be any good. I remember somebody telling me, you're never amount to nothing. What they did was just gas my life because I refused to believe that. But it's caused because there were people who countered that by saying, you're going to be all right. People like my parents, my mom, countered that. So many times we don't realize how words could even start a war. People could go to a table to talk and to have discussions about where they go forward. But then somebody says the wrong thing and there's a war. Words can start a war where millions of people can die. War, words can talk people into voting for somebody that they may not have voted into if they just paid attention to the person's actions. Because the Bible says you cannot judge a person 
by their words, and, and they're going to see this in this passage, until they keep repeating and repeating the same thing over and over again. The Bible says when they're doing that, then you could judge them because they're describing who they are on the inside. Everybody's allowed a word that they miss, but they're not allowed to keep saying the same thing over and over and over again, and then you think it's, they're just messing up when they say it. The Bible is saying that's even a pattern with that. Words can cause people to not talk to each other ever again. The people don't even want to talk to each other, don't even want to see each other because words became so definitive that it caused people to function this way. Words have that kind of effect that even Jesus Christ would come and say to, to this earth, I am the word. In other words, with all the words you're going to hear, you can listen to all of these words, but I am the word. In other words, outside of all these words you hear, if you ever turn off the word, you will be falsely following a whole lot of wrong information. Then he adds to it, I am the truth. So not only am I the word, I am the truth. So if you turn off me, you end up in a lot of lies. The Bible says lies are so huge to God that in the day of revelation, in the day of revelation, he would not allow people who kept practicing lies until they died to even come into the city of Jerusalem. They'd be in heaven, but they can't get into the city of Jerusalem because they kept practicing lies up until the point of their death. That's how huge words are. Young people, you turn them on. You look at social media. You listen to different songs that are being played. You, you turn on music. You, you listen to friends and what they're saying. And what we don't realize is that Satan is taking a tool in a tool chest that God has provided that is very powerful in order to shape your life and to move your life in a direction that he knows he can move it. He even lets you call yourself names. And that many times when you keep calling yourself certain names that begin with B, it shapes how you end up functioning as a person. And I always tell people, anybody to call your girl child that, kick them out the house, please. So you have, you have those names that now girls, young people call each other, not realizing that that sometimes even drives them to become what they're calling each other. Words are that powerful. They're that descriptive and that definitive <laughs> and sometimes that destructive. So let's take a look at this in, in Proverbs chapter 15. Look down at verse 4. He says, a smoothing tongue is a tree of life. What does he mean by that? He's saying a tongue that is focused on peace. In other words, a tongue that is trying to solve problems. A tongue that is trying to come to good compromises and resolutions. A tongue that is seeking to, the word soothing is not a tongue that is in trickery. Or a tongue that is trying to make a person feel wonderful when they're speaking. You know, like when we were dating and we, we used to use all of the words that came from Marvin Gaye. Y'all don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about, you older people. Y'all use them words. Y'all listen to them and they became, we, we didn't know nothing about macking in them days. We just, we, we just kind of, you know, use them words. We use those words to create relationships. We use those words to create peace. We use those words to create something that would lead to harmony. That's what he means by soothing words. Not soothing in our culture means somebody that's trying to just make you feel good like a Marvin Gaye. That's not what he's saying. So when I come to a conversation and my focus is to focus the issue attached to what needs to take place but to arrive at a, a, a conclusion that is productive, the Bible is saying that is a, a tree of life, meaning a tree of life. We've dealt with that a couple of weeks ago. A tree of life is anytime you see the tree of life, it is life. It is breath. It is fruitful. It produces something that is productive. That's why it's a tree of life. Even when you go to Revelation, we talked about a couple of weeks ago in Revelation, the tree of life will even be something that the people coming in from the millennium in, in earthly bodies will eat of the tree of life so they can stay healed to keep living in a human body forever. The, this just tree of life literally has to do it produces life in the person. So the, the relationships, what we're trying to do produces life in the individual. It helps the individual to be better. It helps the circumstances in the house to be better. It helps our, our people around you to be better. And young people, many times when those words are used, people think you are all kind, they give you all kind of names. Are you, what's wrong with you? You don't talk like us. 
I remember growing up in this country with a massive accent when I first came. Like it, it ain't totally gone. Y'all know that. But <laughs> I remember growing up, what are you talking? You talk funny. How could, a, how could a black guy talk funny like this? It was thrown in my face. And so many times, even people coming from a different culture, when they speak a different way, they're throwing things in their face. Young people, when you talk and you don't sound like the other kids, you don't sound like how the other kids talk, the Bible is saying you don't have to sound like them. You don't have to sound like the kids that know how the world operates and they seem to be with all the proper jargon and they're cool. That don't make them cool. What makes cool in the person's God's life is that when we finish speaking, that's why I don't unwholesome words come out your mouth. He says when we finish speaking, it could breathe life into the situation. It makes the situation better. So whether it's, whether it's our children that we're talking to or each other we're talking to, he is saying it should breathe life into the other person. It isn't, he's not saying it's going to be liked by the other person. It's going to be accepted by the other person, young folks. It's not going to be, oh, this person is wonderful in the way things they say. That's not what he's saying. He's saying at the end of the day, it breeds life. That's what you see with Jesus Christ when he spoke. It bred life into people. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when words breed life, the Bible says, those are good words. But when you switch it, right here in chapter 15 of Proverbs, verse 4 says, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. Perversion. We get immediately, when we're in our culture, and you hear the word perversion, we're going to immediately run to cursing. It's actually not what that particular word means. That's later on in Ephesians. But that's not what that particular word means. The word perversion means a person is saying apples, but we made it an apple pie. In other words, we don't even ask the person, what did you mean when you say what you said? It is called decoding when we study communication. Okay? I, I remember this discussion happening when my wife and I first got married. And, and you know, a year later or so, a child was there. And, and we were trying to manage that as a young couple and work and Paul Canning is going to school and all this other stuff. And she said, could you handle the kitchen? You, could you clean the kitchen? Yeah, I got it. Trying to be whatever. And I got it. I finished cleaning the kitchen. She comes and she goes, this ain't no clean kitchen. I remember that being our first argument as a married couple. This ain't no clean kitchen. It's clean. Dishes are clean. Uh, which means they're rinsed and put into the dishwasher. So they are clean. The counter has been wiped down, right? After you wash the dishes, I put everything back on the back part of the sink, and I swept the floor, and I'm done. She goes, "Not, nah, not clean. You got to mop the floor. Mop the floor. We know why we got to mop the floor. Nobody got dirty shoes on you." So we started to have this argument because I never stopped to decode. My wife and I got into this argument because I'm going, "Why would you buy a dishwasher?" and not use it or you put it in there to dry off no you put it in there to wash it and then you turn it a certain way so it dries off on itself in the name of Jesus no 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 you put it in there to dry off that is a dryer not a washer (laughs) please please understand too much education does that to you so what, what, what happens is we end up not taking the time to decode what does a kitchen cleaning mean to you coming from different backgrounds people get into conversations the bible says just using words that we associate the fact that because the word makes sense to us it's the same meaning when the person gets it and when the person gets it doesn't decode it and take the time to ask questions to decode it but then go on to explain what you meant the bible said that's a perversion it's a perversion when you're not asking the person, did you mean this? But then I'm going to run off and say, this is what the person said. But it's not what the person meant. The Bible is saying, the minute I keep pushing what I believe the person meant, and the person is standing there going, that's not what I meant, and then you make the person a liar for saying that's not what they meant, the Bible says we perversed it. Okay? How many times did that happen to Jesus walking on earth? It became a perversion. Because we took what the person is saying and pushed it a whole different way. Let me, let me give you another example. For instance, if I came to you and I said to you, hey, open up the bonnet. Your immediate reaction is going to be, open a bonnet? That's a hat. How do you open up a bonnet? But if I go to England 
and I said, open up the bonnet, they will go to the car and open up the hood. In their culture, it means the hood of a car. In our culture, it means a hat. So even though people coming from different cultures may have different definitions for different things, and we don't ask. And that's why many couples end up arguing and fussing and fighting and going through all kinds of problems because they don't take, the, they don't take a minute to listen. So they end up angry because they didn't follow first step, step one. Be quick to listen. One of the struggles we have with our young people is we don't listen. We don't listen to them. They're stupid, they're ignorant, they're fools. They don't know what they're talking about. And as a result of that, young people go to coaches to listen, to friends at school to listen. They go to every place else on social media, they're getting people to listen. Podcasts, they're getting people to listen. Because we are not taking the time to listen because we think that they're stupid. You got a point to that, but it's not totally true. They're growing up, and if they're willing to share their problems with you, how they think about things with you, that is the best place for them to share it because you are the best person to, not, to make sure it is not a perversion. The Bible is saying words, our words, can be that destructive. Here's what he, he adds to it. He adds to it. It crushes the spirit. It crushes the spirit. Oh, the word crush means when we're finished with this perversion, the city that the, the, the word crushes means in their day, not just going in a situation and crushing something like a roach under your foot. Crushing in their world means that what is done is the city, like in Gaza, is totally in ruins. That's why some of you sit here today can't get past what your parents said. Your life is in ruins, many of people, because what was said to you 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it still runs your life. Because when they were finished, it so crushed you, you don't think you could ever make it. How many people have been told you amount to nothing? I've been fighting that amount to nothing for all your life. It crushed your spirit. It crushed you down. That's why this whole thing about edify, build up is important because words can tear down. And it can tear down so bad the person is crushed. I had a simple thing, rule. It's, it's nice to have this information. I don't mean I was perfect, but it's not nice to have this information when you're raising kids. Because my, my kids would tell you, I would find every reason to tell them how wonderful they are. Every reason. Oh, man, you made that bed and looking that good. But I said, man, you, you did a good job today. You, you're getting better and better at this bed-making thing. I, I, they come home, and, it, and I, the only time I think I, my older son dumped this on me all the time, but I got him back. He came home with straight bees. And I said, I'm going to punish you. For straight bees? I said, yeah, because I know you just get, got by. And I'm not accepting these straight bees. That stayed in his head for so many years that when he was attending Rice University, the executive business program at Rice University, he got straight bees. And they said if he keep getting straight bees, they're going to put him on academic probation because of the level of their program. So he called me and he goes, the straight bee thing came back up. <laughs> I, no, I thought in my whole life that was over. But because I said it, and I guess it was so crushing to him that in his mind, I made straight bees. I did good. And I, and I would, you know, I'm blessed here. I'm good. And I'm sitting there on the bed telling him, no, you did not. You, you got by. And this is an argument going back and forth. You're going to do better from this point on. It stayed with him. Thank God he rescued me in the executive MBA program at Rice. And they said straight bees is not good enough for our program. You see, those things stick with us for a while, and they could shape us. They could cause us to retaliate. They cause us to be resentful because we've heard these things for so long. How many times somebody's been told when they were growing up they're fat, and they spent their whole life trying to get skinny, and they never skinny enough? None of our young people in the mirror fighting to be skinny. Just because they have been, God never told them you had to be skinny. Nowhere in the Bible. 
But they have to be skinny because that's what the world teaches them. And it's been perversed because that's not what God intended. God said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. But they got to go get skinny. And they're killing themselves getting skinny, eating green stuff every day, wishing for a pizza. And that's why the Bible is saying right here, you go on to Proverbs, Matthew chapter 15. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15, but I want you to keep your Bible in Proverbs. Stick something in there. In Matthew chapter 15, this is why he says this. And please understand the context in which he's saying this. The context in which he's saying this is with Pharisees, Sadducees, high priests, all of them perverting what he is saying. Constantly arguing and fighting with Jesus Christ every day, rejecting him so much, he didn't go into the city anymore. He stayed outside the city so they don't kill him before his time. And Jesus Christ, in the midst of this negative environment of Pharisees, Sadducees, and high priests, Jesus Christ says these words. It's in that culture, in that environment, in which he says these words. In chapter 15, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 18 says this. He says, Verse 18 says, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. So in other words, if I stick with perversion and I keep saying something over and over and over and over and over again, even if it's a lie and I keep pushing that lie, the Bible says what happens is not just the person is crushed, the person who is saying those things end up, the word defiled means make themselves unclean before God. So the words not only hurt the person that's being crushed, it hurts the person who constantly keeps repeating it over and over again. It defiles them. That's why the Bible is saying words. It's a short version of just words. How powerful words can be by themselves. Words. And we, are we jumping into social media. We're jumping on the television. We're listening to everything. And the Bible is literally saying that. I know, forget, you all have heard this before, but I can't help but say it. I remember um, years ago, I was looking at a Bang Bang Shoot Up movie. And then I was playing soccer. Uh, on Sundays after church, I'd go play soccer. My kids would come with me. I know, on a soccer field, words. Words are words. Especially when you beat somebody, words are words. And so we're riding on a scooter in Freeport, Bahamas. And, you know, they, they, they drive on the left side, not the right side. So I made a turn and ended up back in America on the right side. And sure enough... I realized I was wrong with my son on the back. I did my best to go back to the left side and I cursed. And don't forget now, I am out speaking for the Lord. And we are making a vacation out of it in the Bahamas. We made a vacation out of it. And my son could not get over it. Now, we were supposed to be dead, but he's into this word. It's not a real, real bad curse word, but it's, it's a curse word. But at the end of the day, he goes into the room, and as soon as he sees his mom, and we stop at the hotel, he runs from the back of the bike, and he goes to mom and says, Dad cursed. <laughs> then he goes on the bed, and he's jumping up and down saying, I'm going to tell grandma you cursed, daddy. I'm going to tell grandma you cursed. Because uh, she know my mama. My mama never accepted we were grown. She would slap us at the age of 50. She didn't care. So he knew that, and he was going to go tell grandma, grandma, daddy cursed. And he could not get that over. The whole time I'm speaking, it was so humiliating that when I get in the car, I'm going to tell grandma. I just finished preaching my heart. I asked God to forgive me a hundred times. And my son is still, and that one word stayed in his head. The problem with that word is, if I kept saying it, the Bible is saying, now I'm on the, I'm, I'm in God's eyes, I'm unholy. I have made myself unholy in his eyes because I kept doing that same thing over and over again. It was not a word that just came out that one time. It is who I am. So the words don't just crush the person. It defines the person who consistently repeats it. It consistently repeats it. 
And that's why he says this with words. And that's why I'm saying to you, Satan knows the power of this. That's why he's got so many words coming out and God only got Tuesday and Sunday. He knows God only got Tuesday and Sunday. So from, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, words. He's trying to get your mind, your heart, define who you are because words matter. In God's eyes, words matter. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Words matter in God's eyes. That's why the Bible says a wise person would learn to keep their tongue. When you see, the Bible says a fool is the one who just keeps talking, 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 talking. Is a fool. But a person who's wise will pick their words and, and work their words to a particular situation. A person who's wise does that, but a person who's not wise, they will not do that. It's all over the Bible. We could stay in this forever. Matthew chapter 13 says this, but I tell you, every careless word that people speak, they will give an account. It's powerful. He says, what I'm telling you, I will never stop saying. He's got to say that in the Greek text. He's saying, I'm not just saying this in this one time to the disciples. I'm saying that it's going to be this way forever. And he says, the careless word, a careless word is a word that ain't got no facts to it. It's different than perversion. Perversion is actually hearing what the person says and without trying to decode what they say, I decide it means this. And when the person says, I never meant that, you're going to still insist that that's exactly what you meant because I know what you're saying. Okay, how many times you've been in a marriage where people say, I know what you're thinking. Dangerous words. You don't know what the person is thinking. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, the only person who knows the thoughts of a person is the person who's thinking it. It's right there in the Bible. So he, that's why he covers this whole issue of perversion. That's perversion. But careless is when a person is saying, I don't care for the facts. I don't care what facts you got. I don't care what you, you're saying. I don't care to even look for the facts. What I care about is what I think you're saying. The Bible says that is a careless word. Anybody that carelessly speaks, he says, I'm going to take that careless action and I'm going to hold you accountable until the time of your death. Because that word is what is called, later on in the Bible, we don't have time for, it's called slander. It's like what the world does to people today. A person could be a slander. They don't care. Well, here's the facts. Fact check. Look at the fact check. Who cares about the facts? This is what we're going to say to win this election. Period. We don't care what the facts say. We care what we intend to say. Perversion leads to no facts. No facts lead to slander. And that's why he says, you're going to slander somebody? What does he say in Proverbs chapter 6? There are six things God hates, yea, seven. And it's a lying tongue. He hates it because he is the truth. The word hate in the Bible means I despise this word. Perversion, careless words, no facts necessary, no information necessary. This is what I'm going to believe, what I'm going to think. I'm going to do what I want to do with my words. It's my words, it's what I think, it's what I want to be. He said, that's careless. And I'm going to hold you accountable for it. That's why we can't just play with words. And the social media and everything else is just throwing around words. We're just grabbing at them. Watch what he says in verse 37. By your words, you will be justified. You'll be found either right. This is how the accountable process works. Right or wrong. You'll be either found right or wrong. So wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me just by words you could tell if I live a righteous life or not? He says, yes. I could tell who lives righteous by the word choices they make. By the way that they focus in how they speak. I could tell that person is so committed to what I'm saying, what is important to what is the truth to the situation, that they're going to do whatever it takes to analyze what it needs to be and say what they need to say. That person, I could tell you by the way they're acting with words, who they are. So if a person is perversion, careless, the Bible is saying they show themselves to be who they are, defiled. So that's why you just can't just use words. That's why this culture ran by Satan, who's the prince of the air, who is the power of this world, 1 John chapter 5, just use words. He knows what he's doing with them. He knows why he wants to do it. When my kids were growing up, they couldn't look at R-rated movies. 
kids are growing up, we couldn't look at PG-13 sometimes because we checked the movie out. Sit down and watch the movie. Sometimes we sat with them. What do you think about what that says? They used to hate that. I wasn't the one that slowed the TV down all that. <laughs> no, that's why I put my wife on blast. But my wife loved those discussions. Matter of fact, her grandkids come over and she wants them to see movies that teach principles rather than just a movie. What does this movie teach? So she gets some of them old movies about dogs and they, you could tell they're enduring it because Gigi wants them to look at it. You see they're laughing over there. But she, is, but she wants to teach principles in the movie, just not a movie. You get your chance to look at whatever movie you want. But some movies I choose teaches you principles because she understood the importance of words. Satan is polluting this culture with just words because he wants us to stand before God unjustified, held accountable for words. He says, by your words, you will be condemned. And that's why we must speak life into people. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. We must speak life into people. Our young people are being beaten up. You know, the joke I have with my granddaughter is, who do I beat up today? Because a few, well, about a year or so ago, she come and tell me, well, these kids at school say this. These kids at school say that. These kids at school say that. And I'm saying, oh. to her, it's just kids talking. To me, it is Satan trying to define her. And I don't want to put all his verses into her head and all that other stuff yet. I just say, who do I beat up today? As a joke, because my muscles ain't the same now. <laughs> you know, the truth is in the mirror. <laughs> I may think something, but reality hits when you stand in front of the mirror. See, that muscle's in there no more. Then when you try to regain them, you need Tylenol. <laughs> you know? So, so please understand why. A lot of times we don't seem to realize that, what did the Bible say? You don't wrestle with flesh and blood. You wrestle with what? Principalities and powers. So when, to her, it's just people talking, is the fact that I don't like the self-confidence that she's lacking. Because of words. See, why? Self-confidence is important. Why? When you come to a situation and maybe as a child you don't know all the reasons why this is right, but your parents say it's right. The Bible says it's right. The church house says it's right. And you stand and hold your ground about what you need to say. That's self-confidence. You may not get it yet, but when you hold to it, the Bible says you preserve your own life. So speak life. This is how you speak life. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. And don't forget, this is a short version of a whole series you could do on just words. Words. Look at verse 29. He says, let no one unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. What is unwholesome? Look at chapter 5. Unwholesome words could be verse 4 of chapter 5. He says, there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. So a person speaking ways that would lead a person to be crushed using filthy language. You know, young people when the parents ain't looking. Hello. I was like you sometimes. My parents weren't looking. I'm on the soccer field. Somebody knocked me down. I get up. I want to do something. You know? Uh, I, they, they cussed me. I want to cuss them back until God convicted me that how could you be this double-minded person, this person that is a hypocrite, one thing on Sunday, one thing with your parents, and another thing on a soccer field. Because I wanted to show people I ain't no punk because I'm a Christian. <laughs> Worst scenario, paradoxical, anti, you know, oxymoron as you could get. I ain't no punk. You can't push me around on this field, but I'm doing it a sinful way. How's that a Christian? The Bible is saying, then I needed to be addressed and which took place when my parents found out. They addressed it the way they know how. That left such a painful experience on my bottom that nobody could remove that memory that fixed it for me. Unwholesome words also means rotten words. 
They have no value in them. You're just talking with no value. Podcast, social media, have no value in them. You don't get built up from them. You don't get any better from them. You don't get any stronger from them. So it's unwholesome. It doesn't do anything for you. It's just words. It's entertainment. And you're listening to it. Entertainment. And so guess what happened? You're bringing emptiness to your life. You spend all your life hardly reading the Bible, hardly looking at the scriptures, hardly listening to a message, just getting emptiness every day, looking at all this stuff. And he's saying, why taking all these unwholesome words that are empty and which, what eventually does, it rottens your soul. The Bible says it rottens it because your soul needs to be built up. Your soul naturally needs some food. Your soul naturally needs some strength. Your soul naturally needs to grow up. Your soul needs it. Your soul needs it. Your soul can't operate in a sinful flesh without some help. That's why God puts sermon after sermon after sermon, Bible study after Bible study, because your soul has to have it. He designed us to have to have it. Because we are made by God who is the word. So if I don't feed the very thing that is the word to my soul, for the creator, as for my soul, my body rots. If you, get a, if you get a banana and leave it on the counter and you don't eat it, it rots. It breeds flies. Flies are flying around the house. The Bible is saying if you don't have words that are healthy, that you feed on, it becomes a mess to everybody else. That's why it's unwholesome. It does nothing good for you. That's why I tell parents, Guard the, 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 your children's phone. Guard it. They ain't supposed to like you. I don't know why we're trying to get the kids to like us. You know how many times I went all the way out? I knew enough sense to, to when I murmured and grumbled against my mother, I was going north. When she finished slapping me, I was going south. <laughs> so I would go down in the yard, go out in the street, act like I'm playing fussing. But today I bless my parents because they first focus on what makes me a better person so that when I grow up to be a better person, I'll appreciate them. But if they were trying to get me to like them, then I would have been a person they don't like. And I will hate them because they're still the same. So don't tell the kids, no, 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 you, you, you're going to put that phone down and do your homework. I never let my kids look at nothing during the week. This is school time. Friday, stay up as late as you want. Your chores got to be finished at 2 o'clock. I don't care how late you stay up, when you get up. But at 2 o'clock, your chores better be finished, finished. I'm trying to please my wife. She ain't trying to work all day. And if the house ain't straight, the yard ain't straight, she ain't straight. So I learned at 2 o'clock, this woman is sick of this. So at 2 o'clock, y'all could get up when you want to. You could start when you want to. You could eat breakfast when you want to. But at 2 o'clock, we're done. But no, if my kids were growing up today, ain't no social media. See Pierre and Paul doing the same thing to their children. Ain't no social media, no phone, no nothing during the week. It's school. Let's do something. Then on Friday, kill it. Saturday, you got to go to bed a decent time. They're sick of coming to my house because, you know, it's churches tomorrow. Oh, yes, Papa, yes. Then they go in the room and cheat now. They talk till 1 o'clock in the morning. Y'all don't be laughing over there. I see you. I know the truth. And they talk and they laugh and they go on for a while. And then they get up in the morning we're going to church. Kids are asking parents if we're going to church. When they have all these unwholesome words, all this junk in their life all week, how are they asking you about church? That's why he says this. I think I've said enough because y'all look very convicted today. <laughs> Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth but those that build up according to the need of the moment. Sometimes in correcting our children, we tear them down. Then we have to rebuild them. Don't do that. Focus on the need of the moment. Sometimes we got to tell our kids they are the worst thing that ever happened from A to Z. Then we're going to say, you're a good child. No, you already bust them up. If they, I had a standard rule, parents. First time you mess up, you're punished. You're warned. Second time, you're punished. Third time, 
It's a whipping. You brought the whipping. You could have stopped it at any time. You had three shots. So I am not whipping you because of my actions. I'm whipping you because you did not do it. We sometimes we whip the kid the minute they open them out wrong. So the kids fear us, not revere us. There's a difference. And the Bible is literally telling us when we go to a child or when we're dealing with one another, children, we are focusing on that particular moment in that particular time and space. And the Bible is saying we don't bring 1922 situations to this situation. I know your mama told me about this in marriage. I heard this. He's saying, no, the situation is what it is right there. We need to deal with it right. And he's saying, then we don't go characterizing the person outside of that situation. We stay in there. You didn't come in on time. Now, you're a good child because you came home. Why? I'm not trying to be this perfect parent. I just read the Bible. I was a youth minister. I studied these things. So I knew how to do with my child. You're a good child. You didn't wreck the car. You gassed it. I'm sure you, did you refill the car when you finished? I refilled it, Dad. You did all those things, but you came home late. So let's deal with why you home late. Not you're a crazy child, I can't trust you, you're no good. All these different things. That's, no, 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 the Bible is saying stick with the moment. They came home late, but they came home, the car ain't wrecked. So sometimes we even use one mistake our kids make. And we kill them with it. And the Bible is saying, no. Some of y'all can't date but two weeks because the girl or the guy can't make but one mistake. That's why I shouldn't have been dating you. That's why I had this other girl on the side. Let me see if she works out. <laughs> Here's the last thing, and we're done. Believe it or not, we're done. He says, when you do this, not only you, this is how you end up defiling yourself. You end up defiling yourself because the Holy Spirit stops growing in you. He's grieved. There's a death happening. That's why the person is crushed. The air in the tire stops, slowly leaks. The person ends up on flat because the person speaking stops growing and they're crushing the person they're speaking to. So they kill the work of the Holy Spirit in that person's life and they kill the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. And that's why they end up defiled. So instead of growing spiritually, because I choose to pick words, I choose to do what God says, I choose in spite of what this person is doing, I'm going to do, I'm going to discipline my life to do what I need to do, and I'm going to continue forward doing what God tells me to do. Instead of that happening, the Bible says there's no growth in the person we're dealing with and in the, pers and the person that is speaking those words. So I challenge you today, folks. Watch your words. The words will define you and define the people you speak to so that you become a tree of life to people around you that they could pick from, not hate, not walk away from. When they see you come and duck, you could, you could become a tree when people finish hearing you. They, they want to hear you again because they could feed on what you say, not resent what you have to say because we choose to take the time with such a precious thing that we have the privilege of words dogs can't speak birds could only sing fish could only suck water and spit it out parrots could only repeat what we say we are the only organism the only animal in God's creation that can say words. There's some animals that are exceptions, but we are the only ones that could speak words. Why? We are the top of the food chain, and we define how this, word, this world lives and functions. So please, this powerful commodity, don't fool with it. Take time with words. Because words, they count. Let us stand. 
We are excited that you have joined us and I pray this message touched your life. We pray that you enjoyed it. We pray that it impacted your heart and we hope that you would subscribe and continue to grow with all the messages that are here. You can find a sermon outline. So we're glad you enjoyed it. Look forward to you coming back so we grow together. Thank you for blessing us and for blessing your life by allowing us to serve you.